Law enforcement depends on his community to be effective. Law enforcement depends on his community to, see, to, to receive guidance. And it's so important that we do things like today to do that. It's a great day not just for Dr. King's legacy, but to remember we have to continue that legacy. Raise the minimum wage, house the homeless, make sure that we don't have young people of color dying in our streets. The parade included an entry from Metro, a replica of the bus Rosa Parks was riding in when she was arrested for refusing to give her seat to a white rider in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. The entry highlights transit's role in the civil rights movement and marks the 60th anniversary of Park's arrest and bus boycott. It's good for the community. We came such a long way. It's good to see people united and sticking together, you know, on one accord. The celebrations continued at the end of the parade with the 12th annual Kingdom Day Festival, an esteemed 8th District tradition formerly known as the Gospel Fest. Martin Luther King Day to me means unity, one love, one family, live in the dream. A thought that perhaps resonates not just with this community, but with all Angelinos. I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. This celebration was also a memorable one for Councilmember Bernard Parks as it was the final Kingdom Day Festival and parade he will have participated in as a council member. The Dr. Martin Luther King holiday also gave volunteers a chance to help underserved areas on what's usually a day off. As Gil Reyes shows us, people rolled up their sleeves and gladly got to work in the name of public service. In the spirit of civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., volunteers from different backgrounds and of various colors united with paint. Together, they beautified two high schools south of downtown. Santee Education Complex and its connecting campus, Frida Kahlo Continuation School. To try to help the community. So we're painting some murals and hopefully trying to make this school a little bit better for the kids to go to it. These improvements all taking place on Dr. Martin Luther King Day, a day set aside by then President President Ronald Reagan as a federal holiday in 1983. In 1994, Congress declared it a national day of service, prompting community cleanups like this one all across the nation. Dr. King's message of equality and service resonates on campus today, where most of the students are low income. Though test scores have improved in recent years, graduation rates at both schools have been traditionally low. Volunteers from the group LA Works hope that by sprucing up campuses, students will feel more enthusiastic about coming here. Following high-profile racial tensions nationwide between police and their communities, this renovation also allows people from different races to break the ice for a common cause. There's so much more cooperation and collaboration um, that doesn't always get reported on. They only see the tip of the iceberg, and that's where some of the trouble is. But um, the collaboration and cooperation and unity between even the police and the communities runs very, very deep. I'm so glad that I have this opportunity and that we all get to work together. Working together on vibrant murals where, in the end, color doesn't matter. South of downtown on this Martin Luther King Day of Service, Gil Reyes for L.A. This Week. More than a 1,000 L.A. Works volunteers took part, and you can actually volunteer all year long. Find out how at laworks.com. It was a four-day extravaganza of art, art, and more art at the L.A. Convention Center. The annual L.A. Art Show has played a hand in turning L.A. into something of an art mecca. Anna Marcos takes us on a tour. Enter through this art at the L.A. Art Show and you're smack in the middle of Little Topia, an art form born in L.A. and now spreading around the world. It includes everything from the bizarre to the mundane, from silicone sculptures to paintings and more, all very pop and contemporary. This art lover tried to copy the Salvador Dali sculpture's expression and came up with new art of her own. If there's an art show, if there's an exhibit, there's a gallery opening up, um, you know, I'll try my best to get in there and, and uh, take a look at what's going on. The L.A. Art Show is celebrating its 20th anniversary. Over the years, it has grown from 250 to 60,000 visitors, selling millions in artwork. Among the patrons, the Terminator himself. We caught Arnold Schwarzenegger looking at American flags. Kim Jong-il appears to be cryogenically frozen. The North Korean dictator is caught inside an American Coke machine. Now that's irony. The show features special exhibits from countries like Cuba, 
The China section has unique ink drawings, while the Korean area features, no, not Kim Jong-il, but a traditional art form called Tan Se Kwa, which is now going global. It's very monochromatic, very simple, and it's an artwork that people are really starting to respond to. The United Arab Emirates set up a fancy tent and served up not just art, but Arabic coffee and dates. There's also a new form of Japanese manga art that features biblical characters. There's lollipop art and a sedate picture of the Last Supper, until you look closer and find unsavory characters dining with Jesus. The theme unconditional love. All in all, a saucy look at art and culture, and it's put L.A. on the art map. I'm Anna Marcos for L.A. This Week. The exhibit featured 20,000 different pieces of art. And in This Week in Tweets, a lot of people went on social media to share photos and thoughts about the L.A. Art Show at the Convention Center. At art for anyone tweeted, speechless by this Johan Anderson piece. And upon closer inspection, you realize that this realistic photo of a little boy is in fact a painting and not a photograph. Councilman Mitch O'Farrell tweeted a photo he posted on his Instagram account from the LA Art Show. He wrote, served on a panel at LA Art Show discussing murals and new ordinance with El Mac and Cheech Marin. And Time Out Los Angeles shared this awesome bird's eye view shot of the exhibition hall at the convention center with all the incredible art on display and as Anna Marcos mentioned over 20,000 pieces. Opinions needed on how to improve perhaps the busiest street in Mar Vista. Venice Boulevard can expect big changes as part of the mayor's Great Streets initiative but what happens may be largely up to you. Gil Reyes explains. Who can it be knocking at my door? That's L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti and Mar Vista Councilman Mike Bonin. They've mapped out a plan to get people's opinions face to face. Tell us what your dream is for a safe and a beautiful great street in your neighborhood and let us get to work finding the resources to make that happen. Speaking to business owners in English and Spanish, the duo led a team of about 100 volunteers going door to door to educate people about the Great Streets Initiative. That's the mayor's push to refurbish 40 of some of the city's most well-traveled streets. Venice Boulevard is one of them. The plan is to make over a nearly one-mile stretch of Venice between Inglewood and Beethoven. This could mean more planters. This could mean more parklets. So long as it's within reason and within budget, the choice is pretty much up to you, Mar Vista. People have great ideas. They want to improve the sidewalks. They want to bring more art, pick up the trash, take care of the alleyways in the back. Those basic things that kind of give a facelift to the street, but continue to invite more investment, more neighborhood shopping. It's a street shop. We try to be creative. Use the best ingredients. Visits gave the mayor and councilman a chance to become familiar and hear concerns from area business owners, most of whom didn't give opinions on camera, but were left to think about it. The mayor and councilman also left brochures on doors about how to best access them before hitting the open road to gather more input. In Mar Vista, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. You can also give opinions about how to improve Venice Boulevard online at 11thdistrict.com slash great underscore streets underscore survey. Silicon Beach gets a little bigger with the announcement of a tech giant's move there. The L.A. Public Library celebrates some good news and L.A. makes its support for marriage equality known. These stories in City Beat. Yahoo! That's the new victory cry of city officials who are happy to announce Yahoo's move from its Santa Monica operations to Playa Vista. Yahoo! says teams currently based out of its Santa Monica office will transition to the new Playa Vista campus this fall. The company's move will bring at least 400 jobs from its current location to L.A. with space to accommodate future growth. Councilmember Mike Bonin, who represents Playa Vista, says Yahoo! will add to a growing energy and spirit as Playa Vista becomes the real hub of Silicon Beach. 
2014 was a banner year for the city's library system and its high-tech programs. Mayor Eric Garcetti announced that the Los Angeles Public Library lent a record amount of e-media in 2014, demonstrating that the city's efforts to keep up with technology are well received by Angelenos. A big part of that record was the introduction of streaming media, which increased library patrons' e-music use by 600 percent compared to 2013. Last year, the Central Library downtown also launched a tech kiosk, allowing library patrons to check out laptops and tablets for use within the library. City Attorney Mike Feuer announced that he will file a brief on behalf of the City of Los Angeles, urging the United States Supreme Court to make marriage equality the law of the land. The Supreme Court announced earlier this month that it will take up the question of whether the Constitution ensures that same-sex couples can marry, hearing all four cases from the Sixth Circuit. Last summer, Councilman Mike Bonin became the first openly gay council member in Los Angeles to marry while in office. He released a statement saying the Supreme Court now has the chance to to finally move our nation past the divisive and discriminatory question about whether my marriage is any different than any other. Before the new year, the city's Department of Recreation and Parks celebrated the grand opening of Leland Rec Center's own Field of Dreams. Let's play ball. And that's what kids in the San Pedro community are now able to do. After the city and private organizations got together to give the Leedland Rec Center in San Pedro a professional baseball field. And the kids could not be more pumped up about their new Dodger dream field. Hey, give me a D. D. O. D. 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 Budget cuts meant a lack of organized programs, which led to an underused park facility, and parents were frustrated. The local neighbors, they saw me walking around, and I was just by myself, and they came up to me, and they weren't happy, you know, about what was going on here, and uh, I wasn't happy either. Debbie Rouser triggered this, this effort and this movement through a Facebook post. And she uh, messaged us and said, we need some help. The city spent $1.3 million to turn the park around. The Leland Rec Center now boasts an outdoor fitness zone, LED lighting, and security cameras throughout the park. The Los Angeles Dodgers Foundation built the baseball field, and the LA84 Foundation also played a key role in making the park improvements possible. It's become what was noted as a place where people wouldn't want to go to what I believe is one of the absolute nicest parks that we have in our inventory. To celebrate the occasion, Dodgers greats including Tim Leary and Al the Bull Ferreira were also on hand to give kids some pointers by hosting a baseball clinic. This is exactly what this community needed. Um, I've been talking for years now to parents, to different people, to let them know that we, we are so short in baseball fields and it's so important that the kids have somewhere where they can go to play. And this is, I don't think that people, that it's really sunk in how state of the art this place really is. In this week's list of things to do, a night on Broadway, the LA Master Chorale and portraits gone wild at the Hammer Museum. If you don't have plans yet for Saturday the 31st, we've got you covered. Check out Night on Broadway from 5 to 10 p.m. on Broadway from 3rd to 11th Street. The evening will feature multicultural entertainment programming in more than a half dozen of Broadway's historic theaters, open to the public especially for this event. It's all in celebration of the seventh anniversary of Bringing Back Broadway, a 10-year plan for Broadway's revitalization. An on-street festival area will feature booths and pop-up shops from downtown LA businesses, a vintage car show, and a family-friendly kids area. Go to nightonbroadway.la for all the details. The Los Angeles Master Chorale, in one of the most highly anticipated collaborations of the season, joins forces with the renowned period instrument ensemble Musica Angelica Baroque Orchestra and the acclaimed Los Angeles Children's Chorus to present two historically informed performances of Bach's towering masterwork, St. Matthew Passion, on Saturday and Sunday, January 31st and February 1st. Both concerts will take place at the Disney Concert Hall with the Saturday show at 2 p.m. and Sundays at 7 p.m. The Disney Concert Hall is at 111 South Grand Avenue downtown. Go to lamc.org for tickets and other information.
Art is something that's alive, something that you can interact with. That's the idea behind the Hammer Museum's Portraits Gone Wild event on Sunday, February 1st from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. It's part of the Hammer Kids Close Encounters program that encourages families to get up close and personal with art, experiment, and create together. During the Portraits Gone Wild event, discover how still portraits can come alive and how images can appear to move when viewed at different angles. You can strike a pose and snap a unique family photo with artist Todd Pleasance. The Hammer Museum is at 10899 Wilshire Boulevard. All Hammer public programs are free. Go to hammer.ucla.edu. And that's a look at some upcoming things to do. He was a beloved television legend who traveled across California, highlighting some of the Golden State's greatest treasures. And even though he passed two years ago, his memory lives on. Yana Kay reports. Over a golden sunset atop of the Griffith Park Observatory, fans of the late television host Hugh Hauser came together to remember and honor a true California legend. He was the only person that I can think of that when he said gold, you felt rich all over. California's gold is... Hauser served as the longtime host of California's Gold, a public television show on offbeat places and people of California. His engaging and charming personality made him one of the most unique figures on television. And the beautiful thing about Hugh Hauser, he would listen to people and they would just tell their stories. Hauser, who also produced many other lifestyle shows, passed away in 2013, but his shows continue to air on PBS and his many fans continue to watch. People should learn from him to not just visit places and take pictures, but touch things, ask questions, absorb the whole experience. We're here today because we love somebody so special as Huel Hauser. So let's just take a moment of silence and think of the beauty of Huel, the love of California and the love of people. A fitting tribute to a man whose legacy continues to shine a light on the Golden Coast. I'm Yana Kay for LA This Week. Fans of the late Elvis Presley gather in Hollywood for what was billed as his longest running birthday celebration outside of Graceland. Gil Reyes reports on the charity bash. This is a special night, special day, Elvis Presley Day in Los Angeles. And here at the historic Avalon Theater, the old palace, we're all going to get together and have a great night salute Elvis, who would be 80 years old if he was still with us today. This tribute show, hosted by events promoter Art Fine, follows in the charitable blue suede footsteps of the king of rock and roll. Before he died in 1977, Elvis Presley performed several benefit concerts to help war veterans, needy kids, and tornado victims. So perhaps it's fitting that this gathering in Hollywood, where Elvis made so many of his films, gives back to the Hollywood Police Protective League, sister cities of L.A., and shows a hunk a hunk of burning love for the L.A. City Fire Department, which also gets a cut from the $20 ticket price. The Avalon Hollywood, formerly the Palace, hosted some of the King's earliest TV performances. Former child star Barry Livingston from TV's My Three Sons remembers. He was working on a movie on the lot, and, you know, he was very nice to me. I asked if I wanted to go for a little spin around the lot. It was a, a real highlight of my life because I've always been an Elvis fan. A night of nostalgia with some 30 bands all paying homage to the king. Like In Hollywood, Gil Reyes for L.A. This Week. The Hollywood community has hosted their Elvis birthday bash for 28 straight years and counting. And that's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. A reminder that you could catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of L.A. This Week. <laughs>
disaster strikes without warning. What if life as you know it has completely turned on its head? What if everything familiar becomes anything but? Before a disaster turns your family's world upside down, it's up to you to be ready. Get a kit. Make a plan. Be informed today. Hola, soy Marisol, desde Canoga Park, la ciudad toda americana. Estás viendo LA City View, Canal 35. Nuestra ciudad, nuestro canal.
Good morning, good morning, good morning. Shh. Like to welcome you to your Los Angeles City Hall. This uh, council meets every Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday at 10 a.m., and the public is welcome. Uh, Mr. Clerk, we do have a quorum. Could you please call the roll? Blumenfield, Bonabusque, and also D. England, Fuentes, Wizard, Cresco, Corinne, Labonce, Martinez, O'Farrell, Parks, Price, Wesson. First order. Twi Excuse me, 12 members present and a quorum, Mr. President. Good. First order of business. Approval of the minutes. Cedillo moves, Gregorian seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Martinez moves, Bond and seconds. Next. Mr. President, before getting into uh, today's agenda, there's been a request from the Office of Finance to receive and file item two in as much as the taxpayer has paid uh, his liability. Okay, so with that objection, that'll be the order. Continue. Very good, sir. Uh, items one through ten are items noticed for public hearing. Do we have cards? Yes, sir. Cards on items one and seven. Okay, let's hold those two items. Members, we're going to prepare to vote on the remaining items. Uh, Madam Clerk, open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Next set of agenda items, Mr. Clerk. Items 11 through 15 are items for which public hearings have been held. Okay, specials, members, specials. Uh, do, Mr. Buscaino is calling item 15 special. Uh, Mr. Madam Clerk, we're going to prepare to vote on the other items. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. All right. Uh, Mr. Clerk, items 16 through 24. Yes, sir. There are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay, so without objection, those items are now before this body. Mr. Cur President, we have cards on all items except for 21. Four and what did you say? We have cards in on all items except for item number 21, sir. Okay, then uh, members, item 21, let's prepare to vote on item 21. Let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Next, Mr. Clerk. On the continuation agenda, item 25 is an item scheduled for public hearing. We do have a card on that matter, sir. Okay, let's move on then. We'll hold that. Very good. Item 26 is an item for which a public hearing has been held. Okay, members, uh, item 26, no specials on item 26. Well, why don't we prepare, Madam Clerk, to vote on this item. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Mr. Clerk, that brings us where? Mr. Pre uh, excuse me, Mr. President, that brings us back to uh, Who are you brings us call to me, presentation. Mr. Presentation? Regrettably so, sir. My well, apologies. I need to go get a hat and a cane. I'm Mr. Presentation. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, nickname. I love it, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Labonge, why don't we uh, 
Mr. LeBonge, why don't I uh, defer to you? The floor belongs to Mr. Tom LeBonge. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I'm uh, joined here by our great city attorney, Michael Fear. Good morning to all you members here. We are saluting some very special members of our community. And, uh, the presiding judge of the recent past and the presiding judge of the now future. <laughs> so if I may go to the past and say how special it is that we have a, this gentleman here today, David Wesley. David uh, is very concerned, as all judges are, doing the right thing all the time. And in Los Angeles, this is a very special spot. It's the busiest court in the world, in the world. So when the Starline bus tour goes down and shows where all the movies were made downtown, I will also say this is the busiest court in the world. But with that being said, his commitment to Los Angeles County started way back in the early 70s as a judge in our area. He graduated from Southwestern uh, University Law School, which is now is where the old Bullock's Wilshire is. Mm -hmm. And uh, the architect for that building was John Parkinson, who also did the Coliseum. He did the uh, Union Station and was part of this building, including 256 other buildings in our city, including everyone that's at Fifth and Spring. Parkinson, the architect, which said how important Los Angeles would be. Buildings, which are so important. And where our judges sit here in the Civic Center Mall, both the criminal courts and the civic courts, from where the great DWP is on the crown of the Bunker Hill down through the Roy Ball building, this is the largest civic center and complex. And I'm very pleased that the work of uh, Lucio Royval Allard is the federal judges are going to get a, a little bigger space over on Broadway uh, to help in the service of justice for all of us here. But I'm going to put my glasses on right here, Mr. Fuentes, because I want to make sure that we salute this young judge, David Wesley, for all that he has done in his time and working in, uh, his way up through the judicial system and his teen court work that was so important, working with young people and juveniles, all the things that make a difference. He was the person of the year in 2013 by the Metropolitan News Enterprise for his recognition as the presiding judge. And I'm going to tell you, Judge, this is a great document with a great seal of Los Angeles on here with a great city hall. In the background, you can see that little court building there that we've got built, built up for you. It's signed by our mayor, Eric Garcetti, and I want to present this to you right now with a big hearty thank you. Judge David Wesley, recently <laughs> our Superior Court Judge, presiding officer. And let me present this here. We'll get this picture for you there. Good job. It's a hardworking county employee. Good job. Carolyn, cool. Very good. Right here. Come right up here. Duke Law School, East Coaster. Uh, long time assisted presiding judge, now the presiding judge. And I know it's, it's from time to time we do jury service duty there and we run into everyone that's over there. And uh, it's also fun to run into constituents and say, how come you're here? And then you get a chance to visit for the time in between. But as a bench, you were a partner in Munger Tolls Olson. And from 81 to 86, you served the United States Justice Special Assistant to the Attorney General. Uh, also was a law clerk for the Honorable uh, Anthony Kennedy when he was a judge of the United States Court of Appeals in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, all the way, you've been in many, many spots within our judicial system and as a member of the Judicial Council, the policy-making body for the California court system uh, from 2006 to 2009, you helped serve on the executive committee as well. On behalf of Mayor Garcetti, I want to salute you for all your work as you come to be the next presiding judge of Los Angeles County. And we don't realize how big our county is and how a partnership is between the city and the county, the municipal government and the county government. There's uh, uh, 88 cities in the county of Los Angeles, uh, and it's so important that we serve everyone well. And the justice system is really a key to it as we look at all of us at the end of the day. Justice Judge Kuehl, congratulations you to you. So Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, I want to call on a privilege of uh, the presenter here, our great city attorney, because he is very familiar, and he is our, our, our wings for us as he reaches out with his team of lawyers and staff uh, for both the municipal side 
uh, and also the legal side is our own city attorney Damien will tell you as well. The Michael wings. Fierce. Michael. Mike, the wings of the city. Yeah. Thanks, you, Mr. <laughs> LeBlanc. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. President, you will always be the wind beneath those wings, just so we're clear. All right. So it's a real pleasure to be here, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc, for allowing me the opportunity. Uh, before I was elected to be the city attorney, I served in the state legislature and was the chair of the Judiciary Committee in the Capitol. It gave me the opportunity to interact with leaders of the justice system throughout the state of California. And I can tell you from my experience both with Judge Wesley and with Judge Kuhl that they are among the most exceptional leaders of the court system. They are, some, they are people for whom all of us should be very proud because they are extraordinary leaders here and on a statewide level. At a time, the judiciary throughout California has been confronting a real crisis because, as we know, there's been a dramatic diminution in resources for the justice system. And those cuts have had a profound impact on every resident in our county, every resident in our state. And all of us, I think, have it incumbent on each of us to do what we can to help restore funding for the court system, which makes sure that our constituents get justice when they're victims of domestic violence or trying to get a restraining order, when they're a tenant seeking to try to desperately stay in their home, when they're a business desperately trying to get clarity and certainty so they can perform the key economic role they play in our society. That's what the court system does, and that's why we should always be supporting it very much. Now, I want to say, with regard to Judge Wesley, we have had the opportunity to collaborate on important systemic issues. Uh, Mr. LeBange mentioned that Judge Wesley is the founder, the father, and the key leader of the teen court system here in Los Angeles. You can't say too much about the efforts of Judge Wesley to make sure that our youth are being put on a much different track when they get in trouble and that their peers have an opportunity to participate in shaping justice. Uh, we have an opportunity in our office to collaborate with Judge Wesley as we work to integrate our efforts to combat truancy into the teen court system. That's been a great collaboration. When Prop D was enacted, we had to work quickly with the court system, find a way to create a system that worked, and Judge Wesley was integral to assuring that that happened, and so much more. And as for Judge Kuhl, uh, she comes to her role with an extraordinary reputation for jurisprudence within our court system, and we face a new common challenge, as this council recently provided us with additional resources to grapple with the implications of Proposition 47 to assure that that is enacted and that it is effectuated in a way that the voters intended. We worked very closely together on that and other systemic issues. It's a real pleasure to be here with both judges, two extraordinary leaders, each of whom is worthy of tremendous commendation. Thank you, Mr. LeBange, for the opportunity. Mr. Uh, Mr. LeBange, and, and, and as usual, our city attorney was articulate and, and straight to the point. It's always a pleasure to welcome you in these, these uh, chambers. But I just have to say this, members. Uh, I met uh, Judge Wesley. We were at a, a grand opening of dorm rooms at Southwestern uh, School of Law, and he and I began a conversation, and then he invited me. Uh, when you have the time, come down to the, to, to the courthouse, and I'll, uh, you know, give you the tour. It was one of the most interesting and amazing uh, uh, times that I had. I don't remember how much time I spent there because the time just, there was like no no time. He was very engaging, very uh, committed. I want to thank you for the service that you have provided and the mentorship. He was really into helping students. I want to say that Dorothy, Dorsey High School and and uh, I mean, so I learned a lot about him and a lot about our uh, court system. And Judge Cool, you have big uh, shoes to fill. But uh, I wish you success, and, and I got a feeling you're going to do all right. But, I will, again, Judge, I just wanted you to know it was, it's been my, my pleasure, and thank you for the, the tour. And I wish you would have told me in advance that I needed tennis shoes. 
based on all of the walking we did. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> Mr. Labonge. Uh, let's hear from Judge Wesley right now. Thank you yes. very much. Well, I'll be very brief. Um, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, and of course, it's an honor for me to be here today, and I, I can't thank you enough for this recognition. Um, it's an honor to serve the citizens of Los Angeles County, where I was born and raised. And I can assure you, we are the largest court in the country with over 500 bench officers, and each one of them are dedicated to serving the same constituents that you serve. This is our city. This is our county. We take great pleasure in providing service to the citizens of our county. You should be very proud of your court. In my opinion, it's the finest court in the world. And I thank you for having me here today. Thank you, sir. Thank and, you. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Koretz, a great Yankee from Hamilton High School. <laughs> and uh, uh, Judge Cool here is very cool because she came from St. Louis. And we all know who's in East St. Louis because he wrote that song, Promised Land. And uh, <laughs> this is the promised land, as Chuck Berry said, when he got Norfolk, Virginia, Tidewater 14 them home. Tell the folks back home this is the promised land calling and the poor boy's <laughs> on the line. You're here in Los Angeles, which is very special. Judge, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for this honor. Council Member Labonge, I'm just so honored. Uh, and really, I accept this on behalf of all of our very hardworking 550 judicial officers of this largest court uh, in the country. They are there today uh, on the bench this morning serving the same uh, public of this city, of this county, uh, that you all serve. And we're, we're very aware of that. Uh, I have three of my colleagues here today, uh, my assistant presiding judge, Judge Dan Buckley, Judge Abe Kahn, and Judge Bill Heiberger. So thank you. And, and Mr. President, I would love to send our court clerks over to get a lesson in efficiency from your clerk. I've been so impressed this morning with the efficiency of these proceedings. So they're, thank you. They're, they're good people. <laughs> Thank you. And Mr. President, I just want to let you know, because the Bradley legacy always lives on, stand up, Judge Abe Kahn, a member of Mayor Bradley's team in the 70s who uh, served in criminal justice planning up there. And Mr. Bradley's looking down at you, smiling real good. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. You betcha. You betcha. And Mr. President? Yes. If I could just say hello to everybody, just Go prior ahead. to council, I had our new council general uh, from Chile just want to wave and officially present his documents to the city of Los Angeles. And Judge Jorge Taga, uh, his, uh, Tagli is the council general of Chile. Let's welcome, say welcome, sir. Welcome. Welcome. Just say a few words. Yes. Just wanted to say a quick word. Th thank you, Mr. Lebon. Thank you, Mr. President. Distinguished. Uh, uh, council members, it's a, very, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here. And I just want to tell how interested we are, not only myself and the consulate, but also the government and the people of Chile to strengthening the links and the relationship with this great city. Thank you so much. Thank you, very Thank much. you and welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Labonge. Uh, Mr. Clerk, we're going to vote on reconsideration of item 26 because there's an amendment. Let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate. 13 ayes. So let's hold it until the amendment is circulated. Let's go to item 7. Uh, called special by Mr. Sean Murphy. Item 7, Sean, welcome. Yeah, good morning. Item 7, I'm for this project, for this item. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let's prepare to vote on item 7. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Oh, Sean, I should have had you stay. Uh, the next item is one of yours, too. It's item 17, Sean. Mr. Murphy, item 17. Yeah, item 17 is another item I support. Thanks. Okay, sir. Let's prepare to uh, vote on item 17. Let's... Oh, Sean, don't go anywhere. 
Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 aye. I want to bring you back for item 18. I am 18. I, uh, I'm kind of against this item. Thanks. Okay. Now, members, uh, 18 is before us. Let us open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Item 16, Mr. Walsh, Mr. John Walsh. Item 16, welcome. And Mr. Previn, uh, if you're here, Eric, you're after uh, uh, Mr. Walsh. This is John Walsh blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. And uh, Jay Walsh Confidential tweeting at Hollywood Dems. This is item 16. Uh, you do, a, a, this is a street maintenance, this is lighting maintenance. And uh, people do get a, a st stakeholders get a, a vote, property owners. And uh, this area is in the valley. Uh, I just want people uh, who want to see really good lighting come to Hollywood. You want to see real poor lighting go to the valley, street lighting. Uh, however, uh, in general, it's better in L.A. than you want to see terrible street lighting. Go to Glendale, okay? Go to Glendale and see what it is under the Republicans. So, again, uh, you're doing a, a fairly good, pretty good, good job on street lighting. HollywoodHighlands.org. Thank you, sir. Mr. Previn. Uh, good morning, Council President and City Council. Uh, that was a very beautiful uh, presentation to the judges this morning from LA County. Stay. I must tell you, uh, I was deeply moved. Stay and Mike on Fuhr, the subject. You know, I will. I'm just giving you a nice compliment, sir. And uh, we'll take it, but I got to have you stay on the subject here. Okay, no problem. So this is about, uh, as, as we discussed, uh, the Bureau of Street Lighting is uh, creating an assessment for a number of properties to put in something that we all support. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Kokorian for his diligent efforts there. Um, and the way we do it in our district is there's a neighborhood council meeting, uh, typically, and uh, the issues regarding these lighting uh, implementations come up. And uh, we have a guy who I just want to call out from our neighborhood council who does a great job. I forget his name, to be honest, but he's always bringing important little pieces of traffic information uh, to the council, and then he brings it down, down to City Hall, and he's able to expedite it quite quite efficiently. So I want to say thank you to all of those uh, members in the neighborhood councils around the city who help in this way. Um, and one detail, uh, because as you all know, they have recently changed the rules for neighborhood councils so that uh, they are no longer required to provide minutes. Now, this is, uh, on the one hand, sounds efficient. But uh, for those of us who have been to meetings, sometimes uh, the vote itself, uh, for example, in this session, 13 eyes. It doesn't give one a sense of what the discussion may have been if you're looking at the item and didn't happen to attend. So my request is, and of course, uh, I think Studio City Neighborhood Council are folks who intend to provide minutes regardless. Can we look at that matter and see if it could be uh, adjusted so that we do require the provision of minutes? Those who are late could be urged to provide them before they get their next funding. I think it's really in all of our interests, uh, who, those of us who want to pay attention. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Let's prepare. To vote, let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. We're now going to move to uh, item, item 19. I think Mr. Sachs, Mr. Arnold Sachs on item 19. Good morning and welcome. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Arnold, uh, and welcome back. Um, I held this item. Actually, I held this item. The amounts that are collected on these assessments all differ. And I was just wondering how the assessment is assessed, because they're all different amounts. Um, it's fascinating. Yesterday, they had a meeting, the Board of Supervisors, they had a lighting district, and they transferred some property from 
the Lighting District A to Lighting District B, and the assessment in Lighting District A was $1, and the assessment in Lighting District B was $20. So people had their property assessed at a different rate of $19 more, which is quite outrageous, I thought. And the number of people that are involved in these, the Lighting District assessments to properties, how is that tabulated? Who gets to vote on these assessments? It's important because, again, you have different amounts for these different regions. Okay, let us prepare to vote on this item. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Mr. Sachs, I'm sorry I let you get back to your uh, seat. Let's take up item 22, which is called special. Mr. Sachs passes. So, members, now item 22 is before us. Let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Okay, now we're going to do item 15, which was called special by uh, Mr. Buscaino. Thank yes, you, sir, Mr. President. Thank you, sir. Colleagues, uh, this item before you talks about continuing to find ways to redevelop our L.A. waterfront down at the Port of Los Angeles. Um, the Port recently, uh, this last week, has put out a series of community uh, hearings on moving forward on the fund community funding um, policy. And what we found, even more so last night at the Warner Grand Theater, was a united front, a united front of residents from San Pedro and Wilmington calling on uh, action, calling that we, the port, the city moves forward on waterfront redevelopment. And we're just so excited to see these foot soldiers come together and demand action. Um, as you're all aware, I've been working to kickstart the redevelopment of the LA waterfront since I took office three years ago, February 1st. Uh, working with the port, we've selected a developer to build retail commercial elements of the waterfront and have been contract negotiations to redevelop the ports of call. Two months ago, uh, the port reported to uh, the Trade, Commerce, and Tourism Committee on the findings of the study, which analyzed the financial uh, feasibility of the developer's proposal to redevelop ports of call village at the LA waterfront. The study made some sensible recommendations that were specific to the developer's proposal and also reinforced many points made in previous studies done at the waterfront. However, I believe that because of this project's regional significance and potential to act as a catalyst for economic development, not only in the harbor area but the entire city of Los Angeles, the feasibility study was not enough and further evaluation was needed. And we all know that additional sales tax revenue, more hotel taxes, business taxes, and, and more tourism is good for the city. In fact, in 2014, last year, we had the best tourism numbers the city has seen in decades. The redevelopment of the LA waterfront is just that, and it's important that we study these impacts as well. Therefore, I asked our chief legislative analysts to work with the Economic and Workforce Development Department and the city administrative office to one, provide a summary of the history of the waterfront redevelopment efforts at the port, uh, including previous studies and, and reports, master plans, along with previous RFPs and RFQs, to report about the Thailand's trust restrictions and the city charter and any recent legislation having to do with commercial, retail, residential development on state Thailand's property and models of successful waterfront development in other big cities. We've seen incredible turnaround at the ports in Oakland and San Francisco and San Diego, and we're saying, why not us? Um, and it is possible. And the state has been uh, legislation, state legislators have been champions in seeking restrictions um, in, this, in, the, um, in the state Thailand's. Also, I've asked um, a report uh, to provide recommendations on how the city can work together to capture the opportunities at the waterfront to maximize economic benefits. This report before you will serve as another tool to guide decision makers and, and the city and the port as we continue to move forward uh, with the transformative redevelopment of the LA waterfront. I want to call um, John Wickham and 
our uh, port director, Gene Sirocco, to the table. And if you can please join us, they are joined by Commissioner Dave Arian. <clears throat> Welcome. And also, um, we have our deputy mayor here. Um, the, we call him vice mayor in, in Asia, didn't we? <laughs> Thank you so much, Kelly. Kelly Bernard, thanks so much for being here. And also the new deputy executive director, Don Liu, uh, representing the Port of Los Angeles. Thank you, Don, for being here. The um, new. Did you know the that? The new. I did know did that. Don left City Hall, back home at the port. Sure, no, not actually, officially not yet. But. So, John, tell us about um, redevelopment efforts at the L.A. waterfront. Um, obviously, it's had a long and rocky history. We've been talking about this since I was a kid growing up in San Pedro in the harbor area. Um, the project has gone out to RFP a handful of times. Um, in the last 15 years, I, I know it's been out several times. We haven't gotten many hits on it. Um, for a, a variety of reasons, it has failed. Can you explain to us why um, we really haven't seen the, the ongoing progress specifically on uh, retail commercial development along our waterline? So good, good morning, John Wickham with the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst. Um, our, we have a report on file for this and a number of recommendations. We, at, at your instruction, we looked at, um, at a number of technical reports, planning reports, ULI studies. There's been a significant amount of work on this waterfront area. Um, we went back just to 1995, and I'm sure there's much more beyond that as well. Um, there were two key points that I think came out of reviewing all of this substantial research and review of this area. Um, one is the history and authenticity of the San Pedro community is a great strength for that, um, for that area and should be a component of whatever gets built there. Um, it's uh, not so much, you know, Port Sacal is a, is a New England fishing village, which is not really the history of San Pedro community. Um, the strength of San Pedro community is the um, cultural diversity um, that built that fishing industry, and that really is a strength. Much like, you know, as, as we were just speaking, you know, Venice has its own unique identity, and that's the strength of what draws people to that waterfront area. That's the kind of thing that San Pedro should be building on in its area for this waterfront. Um, the other key point was all of this work has led to the waterfront master plan with an environmental document that supports all of this development. It's a real strength for this, for this community, it's something to build on and will take you um, into the next phase of the work that you're trying to accomplish. There were two very significant constraints. The first is the um, city charter, which limits um, contracting periods to 50 years, as well as state law, which limits both the, the ability to contract for no more than 50 years, as well as the types of uses that can be built on the waterfront property. So there are significant constraints that need to be considered and evaluated both within city laws and within state laws. Um, and then one of the major opportunities, I think, to help move this forward would be addressing some of the management issues for building out this plan with the Harbor Department. I understand that the Harbor Director has recently reorganized and that they have some information on this subject matter. They've given this some, some thought, and so um, we're looking forward to seeing what uh, can be John, uh, appreciate that. Uh, the Port and his consultants, along with uh, outside organizations, have conducted a number of studies. You mentioned the ULI study, <clears throat> I believe it was out in 08, uh, in the area, and made a wide range of recommendations for redeveloping the waterfront. And uh, we all appreciate the research, but we need to start seeing action. Um, can you tell us about some of the sources that you used and the people that you spoke with when you put this report together? Um, the Harbor Department and their staff were very supportive and very helpful. Uh, the city attorney's office was very helpful. We spoke to a number of developers as well, to the ULI, and um, all of them have uh, really supported these, uh, the concepts that emerged in these reports. It's still for foremost in their mind, these are the issues that they saw as ways to help move forward. Appreciate that. And then also you mentioned state tidelands, and uh, I'll ask Gene, to, for, the, for the record, for the, the general public, I want to talk, you can talk about the restrictions of the state tidelands and the usage and the restrictions. I want to um, introduce Gene Sharoka, our executive director of, of the Harbor Department. Um, thank you, Mr. Sharoka, for joining us. Can you, um, before I dive into the waterfront questions, can you give us a, a brief update on uh, current uh, operations at the Port of Los Angeles? Yes, Council Member. Mr. President, members of Council and public, good morning. 
The maritime industry is going through profound change today, financially driven change that has led to new partnerships and alliances, larger ships, different patterns of conveyance within the supply chain, all of which need support and improvement. Today, we have more than 120,000 containers sitting at our port, not moving, that has created an epic level of congestion. Many areas, in addition to the larger ships and newly formed alliances, include dislocated chassis inventory, Western Railroad's metering exports to the point where the export numbers from our port dipped by 12 percent in the fourth quarter of calendar year 2014. We are working on a number of solutions, one of which includes our continued support to reach agreement between our talented and skilled Longshore Labor Division and the employers at the harbors along the west coast of the United States. Other solutions about bringing information technology and inventory management systems to the harbor will, I believe, help create a line of sight within the supply chain that allows us to bring fluidity back to that conveyance process. As we move forward, we will need to change as well in our operating mode at the port. The business model has changed in the maritime industry. We will need to stay a step ahead of that. Operational efficiency and terminal velocity business plans led by our Vice President of the Harbor Board of Commissioners, Dave Arian, will be quite impactful as Longshore Labor comes back to work in full force. And we believe the vision that Commissioner Arian has will take us to that next stage. But these are critical times in the port's business. We account for more than 830,000 jobs in the region, creating more than $35 billion in wage and tax, not only an economic engine of Los Angeles and Southern California, but for the nation. There are more than three and a half million jobs associated with the cargo that moves in and out of our port in LA. So it's of paramount importance to all of us in continuing our work around the clock to help enable our supply chain partners and customers. Thank you, Gene. You, obviously, it's clear that this port of Los Angeles is an incredible asset, not only to the region, but this entire country. And our goal on the waterline is to ensure that we re redevelop our waterline uh, so that our downtown San Pedro and Wilmington skyline matches the crane lines that oversee the port. Um, give us, um, for my council colleagues who are here, give us an update on and a brief overview of the projects that have been completed thus far uh, by the Port of Los Angeles as it relates to uh, waterfront redevelopment. In summation, the Harbor Department has invested more than $600 million over the past 10 years in our communities that are aligned with the waterfront. Those would be San Pedro, Harbor City, and Wilmington, to be specific. That money has gone to such great projects as the Waterfront Promenade, the Red Car, Fanfare Fountain, 22nd Street Park, the work that's been done also on the 35-acre Wilmington Waterfront Park and many other areas of improvement, including infrastructure to enable both vehicular and pedestrian traffic to come to our waterfront. Uh, amazing work at the Cabrillo Marina Way. Um, it's something that we, we have also focused on some redevelopment efforts there. Um, the $50 million commitment, the verbal commitment that you gave to the community and to your commission uh, that um, Mayor Garcetti and, uh, and I have been just really excited about moving forward on the infrastructure of the Ports of Call development. Can you um, tell us a little bit about the, how that commitment um, relates to waterfront development uh, along the waterline, specifically which projects this will fund and how long it will take? We wanted to show a level of sincerity and dedication to the redevelopment of the waterfront in Los Angeles, and specifically to assist and enable the potential developer to rebuild ports of call. We took a lot of advice from you, council member, our commission, and leaders within the community. And we felt that putting that statement forward would help create that strong believability that the port would be a partner in future development. What that could mean is the work to be started immediately on Sampson Way. 
Samson Way connector would allow, again, vehicular traffic movement as well as pedestrian to work our way down to the waterfront to enjoy the entertainment and dining opportunities. It will also mean a waterfront promenade as well as a town square. It can also mean additional parking and other infrastructure related build outs so we can have the developer prepared to put their shovel in the ground and move immediately upon agreement. Timeline on the on uh, this, Mr. This Busca, you know, let me uh, get a few other sure. members and then we'll I'll close, push my button again. close with you. Mr. You. Uh, Labange. Mr. Busca, you know, I wanted to compliment you and the work that you're doing and the key is success. That's the key. In our city, there's three major things that make it happen. One is the Department of Water and Power. Without Mulholland, without those who built the system, without the water, no city. Two, Phineas Manning coming from Wilmington, Delaware, to create the Port of Los Angeles, and also our cousins next door at Long Beach. Uh, and then uh, the third thing is Los Angeles International Airport. And to hear the report that Mike Bonin gave the other day, we're all going in the right direction. What is key is that you get the people back to the water on the waterfront. When you go up to San Francisco and you walk along, you're at the water. It's about the water, to get them to the water, to bring San Pedro. And if you look back at if the uh, uh, sociological uh, sections of uh, SC or UCLA looked at the redevelopment of San Pedro to take out Be Beacon Street, that was the last big bad street taken out. Pasadena did not take out Colorado. They kept the 35 on the corner, but they transformed the city because that old part was there. We lost that. We thought we could do that. So you're going to balance that out, bring it back. It's so key. I want to compliment your predecessor, Janice Hahn, who did some great work in the, in the, in the uh, uh, Bay to the Breaker, the Bridge to the Breaker and all that work. St. Vincent Thomas Bridge, named by Bobby De Niro in the movie Heat. Uh, the lights on the bridge, it is really a place to be. I recently thank you, uh, one of your captains gave me a tour of the port, uh, and it's, I'm very proud of it, but more needs to be done as you go forward. A couple questions I just want to ask. The 2020 plan uh, spoke about consolidation. I sometimes think when there's two people next to each other, they could do as well as consolidation because they have competitive edges on that. What's your opinion on consolidation? And do you do cooperative things right now with the Port of Long Beach? Yes, Mr. Labange, we have a long history of cooperative work between the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. We have four sanctioned Federal Maritime Commission agreements that allow us to talk about all issues around the supply chain, safety, security, infrastructure, and environmental stewardship. Our work on the commercial side of the business is such that if one fails, we both. 40% of all imports that enter our country come through the San Pedro Bay port complexes of Los Angeles and Long Beach. Our future cooperation is of paramount importance to me. And, and to combine that would not, in, in, well, we're going to discuss about it sometime later. We're going to have a meeting again, Mr. Bruski. And thank you so often for opening the port building for us when our committee has gone down thank you. there. But we want to just discuss that thoroughly so they know it's important to have two, but working close together on yes. that. And, uh, Mr. Commissioner Arian, you once made a, a this statement, which was so good, that I want all my members to hear. You talked about when you went to San Pedro High School, right? Yeah. And then when you used to go up to Palos Verdes, you look out across the basin of Los Angeles, and you point, talk to all that manufacturing that once was there, the aircraft industry, the shipbuilding, the tire, the car, all that industry, which is not there anymore, and trying to capture it back and trying to make sure there's a match there. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for your service and that seared in my mind that statement that you made. Also, I heard on the radio Princess Cruz is 50 years old. And if you don't do it, I'll do it. You're going to do it, Joe. Give him accommodation. Bring him in. Bring that big ship in again. Cruise business is very important in trying to get it back. You doing it, Joe? I, I understand that, but at least you, you throw Lebron. your hand out. All that is important is the combination of tourism. And I finally say that uh, one day I hope it's the San Pedro Freeway that leads the way, not the Harbor Freeway. Put a name on it like Long Beach, Santa Ana, Glendale, and Pasadena. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Labonge, uh, now Mr. Cedillo. For the San Pedro Freeway. Uh, 
First, let me commend my uh, colleague for his incredible work and the responsiveness of your work to the the um, the public. We've seen a lot of these items come through um, the Plum Committee, and I know there's been great efforts to build consensus. Uh, my interest is in housing, and what's your vision um, for that area as a, a place where we can develop more housing? We're you know, very limited in space. It is one of the areas where we have uh, incredible opportunities. Uh, the mayor has set a goal for us of uh, 100,000 units of housing over the next seven years. That's about 1,000 units per, um, per year for each, each council member. Uh, what's your vision for, for housing uh, affordability and building critical mass uh, in that area? Well, that is not necessarily under our area of purview, but our thoughts are in alignment with the city. There will be a study coming up very shortly by the Housing Authority, of which the Harbor Department is a willing participant to take a look at opportunities and the future of housing in our enclaves. Going down line, we, almost, we also need to be mindful of residential housing in and around the industrial area due to our environmental stewardship and the requirements that we have to the community down line. So we'll be an active participant, council member, and we look forward to helping develop new opportunities. Right, thank you very much. We have Mr. Bonin. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, and thank you, Mr. Buscaino, for, for bringing this issue to us. This is a, 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 an absolutely fascinating issue, and it's one that I see mirrored in other parts of the city. Uh, we have so many tremendous assets for the city of Los Angeles that are adjacent to and integrated with residential and commercial neighborhoods. Uh, Los Angeles International Airport in my district, uh, Venice Beach, Griffith Park, uh, downtown Los Angeles, all of these places that, that bring so much value to the city of Los Angeles but can have a, uh, a negative or a harmful impact if not done well on the nearby neighborhoods. And it's a very difficult thing to, to strike that balance. It is not the mission of LAX to be friendly to Westchester and Playa del Rey, but it's certainly the obligation. You know, it's not the mission of recreation and parks to uh, uh, be beneficial to the neighborhoods surrounding it in Venice Beach, but it's certainly the obligation. And I think Mr. Buscaino has become a, a forceful visionary and an advocate for the idea that the port, while it does not have a mission uh, to spur economic development uh, and, and come up with neighborhood-friendly uses for San Pedro. It certainly has that obligation. I appreciate how challenging that is. Uh, you know, the Thailand's trust restrictions are inc incredibly difficult. Uh, not as difficult as the FAA restrictions are at the airport, but, but they're cumbersome. Uh, and I think Mr. Wickham in his report did a great job outlining what some of the, the, the challenges and the roadblocks are. Uh, and I think that's very valuable because now we know what it is we have to work around and what it is we have to do. Um, that, those, those roadblocks and that complexity shouldn't be something that stops us. I, I have no doubt at all that it will stop Mr. Buscaino. Uh, he is uh, uh, absolutely determined to get this done for his community. Uh, the difficult things can be done. I've seen a community born out of nothing over the past 20 years at Playa Vista. I've seen Hollywood transform. Uh, you know, I've seen downtown Los Angeles transform. What happens in downtown Los Angeles, 20 years ago, people said it couldn't be done. People said, don't invest in the Staples Center. Downtown is just not something that can ever be saved. It's always going to be a pot of red ink for the city. But some p folks had dreams and some folks had visions. And I think that's what Mr. Buscaino is really articulating for his community. So I'm so glad to see the, the port invest that, that, that 50 million. Uh, I think that's important. I'm glad to see all the things that, that have been happening uh, from the, the tall ships to the Arizona to, to the big duck, to, to uh, the, the Iowa to the, uh, to the big duck uh, and all the other stuff that's happening down there. And I look forward to, to helping make more of that happen. We need to do the same at LAX and Venice Beach too. But um, thanks for the stuff you're doing and thank you, Mr. Buscaino. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. Mr. Kokorian. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you for, uh, very much for the update. You know, if you, members, if you go to the west entrance to City Hall and you look at those great cast bronze doors by Henry Lyon that reflect the most important moments in the 400-year history of Los Angeles, 
One of the panels on those doors is the creation of the breakwater at the Los Angeles port. And that was um, a, and the, the port was a vital step forward in our going from a little village to a major metropolis. And that was certainly true at the beginning of the 20th century. It remains true at the beginning of the 21st century. Um, what happens in the port is certainly critical to Mr. Buscaino and his constituents, but it should be critical to every single one of us and our constituents, not just people of Los Angeles, but the people of the Western United States. This is the, the largest port complex in North America. This port is responsible for, I think, 40% of the incoming freight of the United States of America. Um, the, the economy of the United States is dependent upon what happens in our port. And if we don't continue to invest in the improvements in the port, if we don't continue to invest in the efficiency of the port, we're not going to remain competitive with the widened Panama Canal uh, or new canal investments uh, in Central America. Uh, this is absolutely of critical strategic importance to the future of our city and of our country. Um, so I want to thank uh, Mr. Buscaino for your leadership. We're all um, really dependent upon the leadership that you've shown here uh, in, in making sure that this remains a vital driver of our economy. But it's also equally important for you and your constituents that the waterfront be a great place to be at. And Mr. Labonge mentioned the cruise ships. You mentioned the spike in tourism, which is certainly true, and that's helped our general fund dramatically. Um, and it will continue to be uh, throughout the, the coming decades. But if those cruise ship passengers uh, disembark at San Pedro and then head straight for Disneyland, that's not helping us that much. We want them to stay and spend their money in San Pedro. They want, want them to spend their money uh, elsewhere within the city of Los Angeles. And, and what you're doing in terms of working with the port uh, in trying to revitalize the waterfront has, has been really a, a game changer. And uh, I can remember going to Ports of Call as a kid and it was one of the great places to go. It was a real treat. We know that it kind of hit on harder times, and it wasn't such a treat to go to, but it will be again. And what the leadership that you've shown and the vision that you've shown, I think, and, and the, the terrific support that I know that you're going to continue to get from the port in those projects uh, is going to be, uh, as Mr. Bonin said, it's going, to be, it's going to follow in the footsteps of all of the other magnificent revitalization projects that have happened uh, throughout our city. And I know that this is going to be another big step forward. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your report. And thank you for the continuing progress we're making at our port. Very nice words, Mr. Kokorian. And now to close, Mr. Buskay or the fine 15th district. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much for um, your ongoing commitment. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to hear you share my vision and my passion to get this waterfront development completed. And, and Mr. Krikorian, you're absolutely right. You know, these are uh, economic dollars that we should be capturing with our cruise passenger terminals. Um, Mr. Cedillo, looking at the housing development opportunities there, you know, if we can house inmates on Terminal Island, why can't we house citizens along our waterfront? Um, and um, to um, Mr. Labonge's point, you know, the cruise passenger, the cruise industry is, is such a, an uh, incredible resource for us. And if, if we have a transformative project, then of course these passengers are going to disembark and spend money uh, along our water line. And, and, and Mike Bonin, um, thanks for your comments as well. Uh, it's amazing what you've done at the airport. And most recently, um, the airport is committed to over $900 million on the infrastructure and bringing transportation to the airport. We're saying, I don't know if we can do $900 million, but we can, <laughs> we can continue to push for those, uh, for those dollars uh, for a, uh, a transformative project uh, along our waterfront. Um, you know, Mr. O'Farrell, in our committee, we hear about the LA River. It's the waterline, colleagues, that's going to bring prosperity to our city, and it has already um, in our ports. Um, when in our recent uh, Asia trade mission with the mayor, every city we visited had waterfront uh, development. In fact, I believe in South Korea, they even built a river. And f with that water line, you had economic development along that water line. Um, 
It saddens me to see construction cranes in downtown Los Angeles and not along our waterfront where we have the Pacific Ocean as an incredible resource. It's great for our downtown development um, and we need that, but we need these construction cranes along our waterfront. Uh, we have that incredible resource which is the Pacific Ocean. Um, I don't want to uh, exclude Commissioner Arian who is uh, not only a commissioner but also a community member uh, representing uh, the Harbor Commission. Um, commissioner Arian, can you just chime in and give us a sense of where your colleagues are coming from uh, on the commission as it relates to moving forward on waterfront redevelopment? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, we support and I'm sure we'll endorse the, f uh, the $50 million that we're talking over the next five years to come as a recommendation, I think, from your office and through Gene, and it's going to be endorsed by the commission. I don't think it's enough. I think uh, we take half of that money that Mike got, or half the money you get for this LA River, we take half of that. We, we think there's a need for the city to be involved, not just the port in this development. And uh, I would encourage not only this body, but the mayor, you know, to meet with the port to talk about additional revenue that can be used to develop this area because that's what it's going to take. And I only want to make one other point. We are in a struggle like we've never been since the 60s in being able to maintain being the number one port because of the changes that are taking place. And we have to reinvest not only in the infrastructure of building terminals, but in human infrastructure if we want to be competitive. And where is that money going to come from? So there's going to be a contention for money, and we need the city of L.A., if it is so important to develop this tourism in the port, you know, got to have skin in the game. And we're looking for the city council, we're looking for the mayor to put that skin in the game. Because that's what it's going to take to make that world-class waterfront that we all want. Thank you, Commissioner. It's a great segue to why we have this report in front of us. The CLA's recommendation and instructions from the TCT committee help us determine how best to move forward with many of our waterfront redevelopment projects. Uh, and I appreciate the research that went into this, this report. Um, uh, and I want to make an amendment to instruct the CLA, Harbor Department, EWDD to work on a state legislative program to address waterfront redevelopment. We have some friends and colleagues in the state, Depart in the state legislature that um, are watching what we're doing. In fact, State Senator Isidore Hall recently dropped a bill in his first week in office um, to see find ways uh, to address the state tidelands restrictions. So um, uh, State Senate Pro Tem Kevin De Leon has also embraced uh, looking at ways to redevelop our waterfront. Even our, um, on the legislature side of uh, State uh, Assembly member uh, Mike Gibson and Patrick O'Donnell, they are on board. They are turning to us to seek these changes needed to transform our waterfront. So um, thank you. Um, Thank you, John and Jean. Thanks so much uh, to Commissioner um, for coming and, and um, supporting and, and moving forward on seeking some transformative changes along our water line. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much. And we appreciate it. That concludes this presentation. Mr. Clerk, next item. Yep. Mr. President, we should first vote on this matter, uh, and Let's we, open should, the roll. We, sh we should first have a seconder for that uh, that motion. Uh, I second it. Very, very good, sir. Over the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. 13 ayes. Thank you. Next item. Mr. President, that brings us to item number one called special for cards. Mr. Walsh. John Walsh blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org or at J. Walsh Confidential tweeting at Hollywood Dems. We're at number one, and as you know, number one is always hearing protest appeals or objections to building and safety reports and uh, the liens. Uh, some of these liens are uh, very, very good. 
uh, hearing protest, Office of uh, uh, Finance, uh, shot creek systems, $8,476. Uh, and uh, 825 West 106th Street, $1,000. You'll see most of the liens are for buildings east of La Brea because uh, the buildings west of La Brea are owned by uh, wealthy people and the buildings east of La Brea are owned by minorities. Hollywoodhighlands.org against racism. Arnold Sachs. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Arnold Sachs. And uh, this item refers to the building and maintenance, the inspection costs, which means you involve personnel from the city to do the inspection costs. And again, it comes a quality of life issue. We've heard that so many different things. We've heard about it, the quality of life with the parks, the streets, the sidewalks, the road repair. But we have inspectors for this. You don't have inspectors to go out for foreclosed property. Maybe if you got some state legislators involved in it, like you want to do for the ports of LA, you could do something to get some more inspectors. But you already have, you know what's fascinating about that commentary? There's five, six state le ex-state legislators sitting in city council right now. So what were you doing to help the city when you were in the state legislation? Nothing. The ports were there. The sidewalks are there. The foreclosed properties are there. The liens are there. So if you weren't doing anything when you were in state legislation, why should we expect new state legislators to do something? to help with foreclosed liens and the ports of call and all this other stuff that goes on. Because we certainly can't have an, or we have an opportunity to comment on public comment about the impressive heavy lifting of the council considering these liens as part of their $188,000, $187,000 salary. It takes a lot of heavy lifting to do this kind of work with the staff that are involved here to be around for, what, it's 11 o'clock, 11.15, that's an hour and a half. To do this three times a week takes a lot of heavy he, lifting. He is not on the side. Uh, it is. It's about the administrative cost, Mr. City Attorney. And if you care for me to point it out on the item, I'll show you, just like you showed me about the Brown Act and the changes in the items on the agenda. Brenda Lee is the next speaker. Uh, yes, I'm, hi, Councilman. I'm here on behalf of my property, uh, 825 106th Street. We received a, a citation for debris. We paid the citation, and now we have a late charge of a thousand and something dollars that we didn't know we had to pay. So I'm asking for you to reduce that or make some kind of arrangements so we can work it out. My husband is the only one working in the family due to the economy the way it is. So I'm asking for somebody somebody to help us because we don't know what we're doing. We're just new f own homeowners. And I'd like to resolve this as quickly as possible. This is the third time we've been here and I don't want to keep coming back. My husband has to work and he's the only worker in the family. So we third need to resolve this. Here. Please. I'm missing, I'm missing hours of work right now because I'm coming down here. I need to know. Thank you, but we want to get this matter resolved. The councilman of the district has requested a two-week continuance. His deputy is talking to building and safety. So within that time, you can try to resolve this issue. We've been trying to resolve this issue since, for the since last December. Yeah. Now on the 12th. We're here on the 12th. If you just go and talk to the building and safety. We have talked to him. We've okay. to him. I can only give you some direction. If you want to debate it with me, no, we can let it go through. I'm sorry, but or it's just frustrating. you can go and talk to the man over here where we're giving him some advice, what we'd like okay, to do. Okay, now, Thank if you. we're continuing, can we get a voucher to come back? Because we paid three times, and we haven't resolved right, anything. You're getting way beyond my pay grade. If you talk to building and safety, they'll help. Did Mr. Herbert fill out a card? Yes, sir. Yeah, I will not call you unless it's Mr. Herman. 
Mr. Parks, as you heard, under 825 West 106th Street for a lien for $1,018.50, your constituents are here protesting and demanding an action of receipt. You should not sacrifice in the name of the lien by extortion to record a lien against your taxpayers, but it is in best interest of this council, and I'm not just going to talk about Mr. Parks, it has to do with Mr. Parks only, that the fine woman and the gentleman are here out of their time with no voucher for parking, no accommodations to finish this illegal process of your liens, and exactly at 1349 North Gardner Street for the $12,000, $199.16 other lien, as I'm bringing out for the record on liens against taxpayers. This is outrageous. But yet I am a fool because I address the issue on the liens. And you sit there in your most ignorant, intolerable way not to address the liens and assist the madam, lady, and man standing there with building and safety as they were earlier sitting here for the last hour for the presentation. Thank you, Judge Wesley, for the presentation. However, and incidentally, the issue on the liens continue to cause more harm to your constituents, and I really hope that Congress, Sacramento, steps in and evaluates the operations of local business by local government to be such. For the city attorney, Mr. Ocano, and as Mr. Herb Wesley continues to speak before me, I say what you do is more harm than good. Thank you. Uh, without objection, continue 1A, Mr. Clerk. Yes, sir, and that would be to February 11. And, uh, and excuse me, sir, for yeah. uh, item 1B, there is a request from the Department of Building and Safety to reduce the lien amount to $4,037.60 in as much as a partial payment has been received. Without objection, note. All right, let's vote on it. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Next item. Item 20 called special for cards. Sean Murphy, St. Charles, North Hollywood. Yes, this item's about lighting. We need more lighting, especially in the 6th District. There's not enough lighting in the 6th District in a residential area, like near Van Owen and Balboa. In a res doesn't have any light. The residents don't have any lighting. We have a WG. Is there a WG here? Mr. Herman. William J. Gaynor, former mayor of New York. I wish to hold my time. Thank you. John Walsh. John Walsh at HollywoodHighlands.org. Okay, this concerns the maintenance, uh, uh, hearing date for the maintenance of the Carmen and Franklin Avenue Street Lighting District. I live a few blocks from there. I've lived at that address in L.A. since 1976. I first moved to L.A. in 1966. Uh, we need more lighting in this neighborhood. I go crime mapping L.A. Go there, and you can get a list of crimes within a mile or two of where you live. The number of rapes and of auto thefts are out of control in central Hollywood. I put it on my uh, website and I put it, uh, you can find it on my Twitter account. And we definitely need at Carmen and Franklin uh, uh, lighting. We need, uh, the lighting is good, but uh, the lighting has to be much much better because all those rapists out there know to come to Hollywood because it's the unsolvable crime. That completes speakers on that card.
So for the roll, Mr. Clerk, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 aye. Next item. That brings us to item 23 called special for cards. Sean Murphy. Thank you. John Walsh. I got one more card. John Walsh at J. Walsh Confidential Blogging. Uh, again, I, I have to do it again and congratulate you. The reprogramming, you don't find this in any cities uh, anywhere near here in Pasadena or the other cities. In other words, what this means, remember out there, if your landlord ha is something in your apartment, it's not up to code, notify your landlord. And then if the landlord, after a certain number of days, does not fix it, eventually he's going to end up in the reprogram. And what that means is you don't pay your rent to your landlord anymore. anymore. You pay it to the city, to the landlord repairs the code violations. I've never had to get to the, anywhere near that the stage with my landlord, but we have lots and lots of terrible landlords out there, especially east of La Brea, okay? HollywoodHighlands.org. Arnold Sachs. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Arnold Saxon. Thank you for allowing me to address another portion of the City Council's agenda involving more heavy lifting. This is this must be the curly of the Mo Larry and Curly items. We have the street, uh, the what the heck, the the uh, loose liens for nuisance abatement. We have lighting districts, and now we have liens. I'm telling you. You should go home and have an extra, a double cappuccino for all your heavy lifting on a day's work today. You have really worked overtime on this uh, item, um, seriously. And with all, and, but again, I would be more concerned, actually a little bit concerned about the use of personnel in the city. We hear so much about, we just heard about, <coughs> if people go out and do these inspections, get hurt, and they get paid for time off, they'd actually get more money. It's a situation where you can't afford to work because you get paid more money if you take time off due to being hurt on the job. So how does that work if you go out and inspect a REAP program or a lean program or whatever, a rent escrow program, and you get hurt walking around and you have to take time off, you get paid more money. So it's, you can't afford to work. Does it make sense? Only in the city of L.A. it makes sense. But that's a different story. And, and the use of personnel to do this when there's so much, again, quality of life issues. We had issues on the parks, but we couldn't address that here. We had issues on foreclosed properties, but you really can't address that here because he is not talking committees. about the rent. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Sachs. That completes your that completes your comments. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. I know. I'm going to talk about the issue, as the city attorney said. I got a note from the city attorney saying it doesn't substantially change the item. I'm not doing that. Stop wasting my damn time by interrupting me. Mr. Herman, please. No other speakers on the queue. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 13 aye. Next item, Mr. Clerk. Joe. If we can, we need to reconsider item 15, uh, do the amendment, and I'll defer to... to uh, Mr. Clerk, at the request of the councilman, 15th, reconsider <laughs> item 15. Very good, sir. The first vote would be to reconsider the matter. Yeah, let's uh, open the roll on that. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Okay. Mr. City Attorney. And just for the record, in my opinion, it's not a substantial change, but out of an... Um, in, in the item, item 15, the amendment... But out of an abundance of caution, the uh, two individuals that expressed the preference to speak regarding the amendment should be allowed to speak. And those two individuals are? I believe Mr. Sachs and Mr. Previn. Uh, Mr. Sachs, come up. Mr. Previn, why don't you get right behind Arnold? Uh, 
Yes, it's Eric Previn, uh, a county resident from District 3 and also a city resident in Studio City and a candidate uh, against Mr. Gregorian. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, that was a very moving uh, report by Mr. Buscaino about the port. I must tell you, uh, hearing from our council members, uh, Mr. Bonin, who was praising the fine work of the individuals on this deal, Mr. Krikorian, who invoked that, that glorious um, panel that does speak to the uh, establishment of this great port. And I must tell you, uh, hearing these gentlemen uh, respect the 846,000 jobs, if I heard Mr. Soroka correctly or, or whoever was speaking, uh, I, think, I think it really goes a great distance towards uh, giving the public a sense of uh, trust here. Now, I want to just uh, recount one very touching moment on Memorial Day when I was down at the uh, Arizona with Mayor Garcetti. Uh, it was uh, a beautiful and glorious day, and the mayor, uh, I don't think anyone has done more than the mayor for uh, for the Arizona and for the opportunity to get youngsters in our community down there uh, and take advantage of the wonderful aspects to our Mr. President, the, the Arizona course, actually is in Hawaii, I believe. I'm sorry, sir. City where, Attorney where's Arizona? Arizona? Speak on the subject. Where, oh, no, it is the Arizona. Iowa. Oh my gosh! Thank you so much. I, I'm my mistake. You're absolutely right. It was the Iowa. Thank you. Um, I, I grew up in New York, and we have uh, the Intrepid. And I used to bring my kids down to that aircraft carrier. Uh, and I got to tell you, uh, it's, a, it's very, very moving. And so thank you for the opportunity to address this item. One question about Marina del Rey, which is also a port. And uh, Ms. Mr. President, this the, is not about the uh, waterfront project. Well, it's about a port, sir. Not I mean, about the San Pedro waterfront redevelopment Well, but Mr., Mr. Bonham was also talking about Venice Beach and about other aspects. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't get that kind of a restriction. But I did appreciate the opportunity to address it. I don't particularly appreciate being quibbled with about what's important about the California coastline. I mean, oh, Anaheim, thank you. Arnold Sachs Anaheim was not in the... Uh... Yes, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. A um, couple of things. Mention about Lawa and its redevelopment, uh, the $900 million, but $900 million is part of almost $8 billion in redevelopment for it's going on at LAX. This is not it's about LAX. On. Excuse me? This is about the port. It was about the port. And, and they mentioned the funding, source of funding. And, and the guy up here said he would take half that money for LAWA. But he didn't mention anything about the $300 million that the previous director had come up with. But we never really found out how she managed to come up with that money to spend because she lost her job. She didn't, mayor told her she had to reapply. And she didn't reapply for the job. So evidently, she got $300 million out of magic. We don't know how that really came to fruition because she didn't have to answer any questions. And we redevelopment, redevelopment, redevelopment. So when you had redevelopment funds, you had no redevelopment. Now you have no redevelopment funds, you have redevelopment. Figure it out. That completes that. No speakers on the queue. With the amendment in place, correct, Mr. Busca, you know, Mr. Clerk? Open yes, the roll. Sir. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. 13 ayes. Next item. That brings us to item 24, called Special for Cards. Mr. Herman. Consideration by Mr. Krikorian from District 2 and that of Mr. Zine, who I don't see here, calling upon the California Board of Parole Hearings, Parole Board, to deny the release, and not to cause any embarrassment, Mr. Krikorian, but let's allow the law, as Judge Wesley was here, and may have recommended that subcommittee oversight or overseas would be well welcome to provide services for preventive future law-breaking criminals during emergencies when confining people, Mr. Kokorian, who laughs because he'd rather see people in prison than to work and prepare efforts. So anyways, Mr. Kokorian, I vote for Eric Previn. I hold my time to one minute. No other cards, Mr. Krikorian. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, on 
January 28, 1981, uh, the firefighters of Fire Station 60 in North Hollywood responded to a, a call. Um, there was a restaurant that was fully engulfed in flames uh, in North Hollywood, and uh, while responding to that fire, firefighter Tom Taylor, uh, who was a, a proud and respected member of Truck Company 60, uh, fell through the roof uh, into an inferno and perished that night. Eight other Los Angeles City firefighters uh, were injured, two of them very severely. Uh, Tom Taylor had two sons, 12-year-old Eric and 10-year-old Jason, uh, and a wife who never got to see him again. Uh, investigation by the fire department determined that that restaurant was set afire for profit by an arsonist, Mario Catania, uh, who was uh, convicted of that crime and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. Thankfully, Mr. Catania continues uh, to serve that sentence in his cell at Vacaville, and uh, on March 11th, he is up for parole. During the last parole hearing, uh, parole was denied. Uh, I think it's important that this city go on record in support of our firefighters and in memory of Tom Taylor and the firefighters of Fire Station 60 uh, in uh, taking a formal position in opposition to parole for Mario Catania. So I ask for your eye vote. Thank you very much, Mr. Kikorian, for that. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. 13 ayes. Next item. That brings us to item 25, called Special for Car. And I have cards here, Mr. Walsh. Mr. Gaynor here? Here, sir. Here's John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. This is uh, a special appeal, so you're going to be hearing about it. I believe that the owner is here, 1349 North Gardner Street, uh, with a lien of $12,199.16. It's, again, totally unfair. You hear these people come up, and every single one of these people who come up here on the lien issues, you uh, finally agree that the lien was unfair, and I'm sure you will agree uh, with this uh, um, lien is also terribly unfair, which should be reduced to zero. Again, the lien is on the area west, east of La Brea, because uh, the area west of La Brea is where the wealthy white landowners are. HollywoodHighlands.org. Mr. Herman Gaynor. Mr. Speaker, this is regard to CD4 at 1349 North G-A-R-D-N-E-R -E Street for the lien of $12,199.16. I find you unfair in the process of negotiating with this item number 25 under liens by Tom LeBonge for Building and Safety Department report confirmation of lien for nuisance abatement costs and other noncompliance of code violations, annual inspection costs, pursuit of the Los Angeles Municipal Code, LAMC, and or Los Angeles Administrative Code. I find you offensive, sir, and many of you who continue to extort the public by your process of the lien. You should certify them by mail. You should work things out. But any of you who have a lien caused by Mr. Concordian in District 2 or Mr. Weezer in District 14, I say come here and protest. They will reduce the charges, and you will walk away without the bullshit. I want next speaker, Mac Nure. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I represent the owners of the 1349 Gardner Street, um, and this is regarding the lien for uh, $12,199 that they, they're assessing on my client. On May 7, 2014, my clients uh, were issued a, uh, an order to clean the debris from their property. 
They received the notice on May 9th. They proceeded to hire Molina Demolition to do the job. Molina Demolition went to the site. However, there were signs posted by Department of Building and Safety that nobody was to enter the property. My client started contacting Building and Safety, asking them to remove the sign so they can remove the debris. In, on May 24th, the signs were removed and my clients were issued a new order that they had to June 1st to comply with the previous order. Mr. Molina entered the property, started removing trees, put his equipment in there, and on May 27th, the city hired another construction co demolition comp company to remove everything from my client's property, including Mr. Molina's uh, um, equipment. And on May 30th, they, sent, they notified them that uh, they, they owe $10,000 and some change just for that removal. My client's contract with Mr. Molina and Molina demolition was for $1,200 for removing two loads from the property. And now they're being assessed $12,000 for the job that was going to cost $1,200. I don't think it's appropriate. I don't think it's fair. And my clients have tried to comply with every order, and at every turn they have been uh, opposed by building and safety. And this property has a very long history of being uh, problematic, and my client just recently bought into it. And they're trying to comply, however, the city is just, uh, basically the building and safety has been handcuffing them from doing what they were supposed to do. Thank you. George Medina. Good morning. I'm George Molina I'm with Molina Demolition. I'm the demolition contractor hired on this uh, property that we're speaking of. Um, I went to the property. Again, we got stopped by uh, various uh, uh, city or county uh, agencies, health department. This is a building, again, that uh, uh, a lot of uh, drug use and, and, and uh, uh, just criminals staying in there and, and causing problems and uh, bad for the community. We, I got stopped, uh, was ordered not to come in. They hired this company that comes in. Uh, they remove the trash from there, give my client a large bill, um, something way beyond. I have a contract for like $19,000 or less for the whole property to be demoed, including uh, the debris that was on site uh, that we left there uh, when they told us to leave. Um, during this time, they also took some of my equipment, um, and they knew the, you know, what they were taking that I had on site. Uh, when I discovered who, what company took it, I contacted them, and they, they were able to bring it back uh, damaged. Um, so I want to know what uh, parameters they, the city goes through to choose a contractor uh, per city of state of California license board. You got to have bids, comparables to look at when you're choosing a contractor to do work for you. Uh, it seems to me that they went out of uh, out of their way to hire a contractor. Maybe they work with who uh, you know because I was told by the inspector that uh, they work with this contractor before and they use him quite a bit and uh, he's out, never causes problems. Uh, this is out of uh, the harbor area, San Pedro. When I mean, you got to choose a contractor locally, it doesn't make no sense to go out of your way and hire somebody, you know, out of the community, um, and then come up with these prices. Um, you're talking about. I'll, I mean, I asked for dump tickets. We can see comparables, uh, apples to apples. It doesn't make any sense for us. I mean, I'm, I've been doing this for over 25 years with my father, and uh, uh, the the amount of the lien is is, is ridiculous. It makes no sense. We need to see proof, dump tickets, and why to go out of the way and why taking property that doesn't belong to them. Thank you very much. That completes the cards on that building and safety. Could you Hi. please give us a report? Thanks, uh, Council President and uh, Council members. Thank you. I'm Senior Inspector Gene DiOrio with the Department of Building and Safety. I'm familiar with this property and uh, uh, what's going on there. We've um, it had meticulous notes, conversations with the LLC and the agent for service photos and reviewed everything. I've spoken to the inspectors of record and his supervisor and building and safety recommends we confirm the lien. Just one technical question, excuse me colleagues for speaking for the chair. <coughs> Mr. Molina said he was there to clean up but we prevented him from cleaning up. Is that, is he, was, he was uh, uh, witnessed that he was demoing the property without a permit. <coughs> so we, uh, we put a stop notice on the uh, post of a stop notice order there, and it, the stop notice said stop all work 
that requires a permit. It did not stop him from continuing to clean. Got it. Or to go get a permit and then you let it do. Correct. Thank you. Uh, no speakers on the queue. Recommendation is for building and safety to move forward on this. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Thank you very much. Next item. That brings us to item 26, sir. Uh, we Sachs. do have amending motions to D.O. Blumenfeld that has been circulated and is now before you. Mr. Sachs wants to speak. No? No, you're out of time. Thank you. All right, note that the amending motions has been circulated. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. 12 ayes. Thank you very much. On um, Mr. Uh, City Attorney, it's my understanding that one of the members wanted to speak on, uh, I don't remember what item, it was 26. In order for us to take that up, we'd have to the, suspend the rules in order to reconsider uh, this item. So on that item, let's vote now to suspend the rules. Let's uh, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Now we will vote on reconsideration. Let us open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Bloomingfield. Thank you, um, Mr. President. On, on This is the item uh, 26 where we're um, reporting resolutions regarding our legislative program. And there is one uh, particular item on there that I wanted to um, remove from that, our, our overall list, and send back to committee for further consideration. It has to do with the inoperable parking meters. This is a bill that uh, we're being asked to, uh, um, it's already been passed, we're being asked to ask the legislature to repeal, to go back and repeal this bill, which in, for two reasons. One, it's a fool's errand because it was 72 to zero. I was one of the 72 people who voted for it, um, and so I don't think we should be embarking on fool's errands. And then on, on the policy, we may have differences of opinion on it. Um, I don't think that people with parking meters, if they're broken, should have to um, pay for it. But regardless, it should go back to committee for, for consideration. It should not be part of the package that we are putting through of all, of all sorts of things. So I would ask that we remove the inoperable parking meters from the package so that it can go be considered on its own. I'd be happy to hear it in the T-Committee. And uh, Mr. Uh, Bonin said he would be happy to hear it in his committee. So, yeah. Mr. City Attorney, what do we have to do to remove this? What's the proper way? Just for me to say we're going to move uh, the items except for? or yeah. Sir, we would, uh, the amendment would be to remove uh, recommendation 1G. Uh, from the uh, Rules, Elections, and Intergovernmental Relations Committee report and adopt the matter as amended. So okay. So move to remove 1G. All right. So how many votes? Okay, we'll accept it as a friendly amendment, and there'll Great. be no need to uh, to vote on this with, without objection. Okay, that brings us where? M Mr. President. Uh, I believe there are speakers on the queue. Oh, really? Okay, Mr. Cedillo. And followed just, by Mr. Kukorian. I was just rising to support the motion, but it looks like we're going to move, so. Okay, and Mr. Uh, Kukorian uh, has, has uh, waved off. So anyway, so that uh, item has been dispensed with. Let's move forward. That brings us where? General public comment, sir. Okay. No applause. If we could have uh, uh, Daryl Gale 
and uh, Sean um, Murphy. Good morning, Council. Daryl Gale, Environmental Advocate. I would like to invite everyone. One, one second. We have a. I, I believe there has to be an actual vote on item 26 as amended. The, okay, it, it, just the, stay the amendment was accepted. Don't uh, don't go anywhere. Objection, so on 26, let's actually vote. Item 26. It's before us. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 12 eyes. Back to you. Start from the beginning. Okay, thank you. I'm Daryl Gale, environmental advocate, and I would like to invite everyone to join us on Saturday, February 7th, for the March for Real Climate Leadership. Californians will come together in downtown Oakland for a rally and teach-in. Come with us on the buses or take Amtrak or drive your hybrid vehicle to the March for Real Climate Leadership .org. Thank you. Mr. Murphy. Yeah, five weeks from, t from Tuesday, we get out and we go out and vote. I'm going to reelect Paul Krikorian. Nuria Martinez will be the next ma Madam President of City Council in July. I hope we don't have a runoff. I will not vote twice. Uh, our streets need to be repaid. That's about it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have Mr. Uh, Jose Martinez and Mr. Walsh. Please come forward. John Walsh at HollywoodHighlands.org, greeting you from the unsolved arson capital of the world. In fact, the fire department did everything they could to discourage the federal dog from sniffing out the bomb, the accelerant, at Da Vinci. And it was the federal, it was the federal government that made them dig into the uh, rubble so the dog could go down and find the, the, bom the bomb's traces, the accelerant's traces. Come to L.A., invest your money, and the whole building blows up. And uh, vote no, no on the two amendments, which will cancel Election Day. Uh, I don't see Mr. Weezar. He's out with his uh, new girlfriend, I understand. And when he gets caught, she'll get a $90,000 job from you. HollywoodHighlands.org. He's horny, isn't he? Okay, Mr. Martinez, Mr. Sachs, and Mr. Herman, and Eric Previn. Well, local government's continuous corruption has been, again, the abuse of public power, denying us strictly to simply one minute. Incidentally, Mr. Koretz, assault on me in October of 2014 is still a problem. I'm glad to see that Mr. Weezar is dealing with his sexual harassment cases or his infidelities that he claims he's not married, but that's not my business, let alone Mr. Englander there who's paying attentive attention that, again, corruption, scandal, sexual harassment on the job is misuse of your power for your personal gain, Mr. Englander, to remind you, and to remind those, again, with the illegal lien process. This involves not just accepting bribes, it could be, but it's using government to tax and make up for the loss of monies that you're trying to recover for the Thank city of Los Thank you, Mr. Sachs, followed by Mr. Previn, followed by Mr. Marine. Yes, thank you, and, and <clears throat> thank you again for the magnanimous one minute of time um, this council team has managed to change on a quick 45-minute um, presentation this morning. 
but at least it's not Friday. I gave up on Fridays because that's just so over the top with the presentations. But it, it was somewhat fascinating. There was a story in the newspaper regarding the settlement at the ports, it, the economic engine that it is, and how the city has allowed, the, through the management of these different committees and whatever, to be in a situation where there's not enough chassis for them to put on, to bring to the ports, to use to unload the cargo ships. So the cargo ships are sitting outside the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach. And nobody has the idea that those ships will disappear one day and the infrastructure that will be paid for will always be paid for, but there'll be nothing here to use it. Thank you, Mr. Previn, followed by Mr. Marine. Yes, it is Eric Previn, uh, city resident from District 2 and also a candidate in the uh, second district race. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, I have asked nicely and I'm, I'm asking again for you to reconsider the Channel 5 directive to reduce in size all speakers in the public who are not city employees or council members. I feel that it sends a signal uh, that is not appropriate. And I, we have now boiled it down, sir, to you and Mayor Garcetti, because apparently it was Mr. Garcetti, according to Justin, who put this uh, uh, rule into effect uh, some years ago uh, when he was the council president. So it is uh, very interesting. So I would appreciate if the two of you could put your heads together on that and, and correct it. Also, we have uh, run into some, and I don't think that this meeting should be um, reduced to a legal squabble session, frankly, but the California Public Record Act is critically important. And Mr. Kirkcorn office does have to respond in conjunction with the rules and laws and a uh, hey, mr. city attorney uh, they've been very helpful but there's nothing that we can do beyond thank that so I would appreciate it if you could uh, thank you help mr. us there. thank you thank you mr. marine Henry marine is there any member of this council that lack the intelligence or consciousness to understand the money sheltered under MOU 35 and 62 are government funds. And these funds are being misrepresented as the, fun, the property of unions in the city of, in, in the city LA and Orange County and various others. In addition, that the 10% sheltered from the take home pay of these city employees is being misrepresented as a discount and not subject to compensation or, or reimbursement with interest. Now, do you lack that intelligence and consciousness? Well, if you stay silent, you must be, because you should be getting the damn money turned over back into the public funds. Thank you, Mr. No applause. Mr. Uh, uh, clerk, that brings us where? Mr. President, Council has motions po for posting and referral. They are posted and referred. The Next. desk is clear. Okay, announcements, members. Announcements. Well, if I could have everyone rise in the council chambers for adjourning motions, if everyone would rise. For adjourning motions, and I, I, I think uh, that I'd like to start it off today with adjourning in the uh, memory of just a great human being that I had the uh, he he worked for me, so I had the pleasure to be his uh, supervisor when I was in Sacramento. He used to run the uh, uh, Association of Counties and uh, for two and a half years when I was uh, speaker slightly before he worked for me and this is a man named Dan Wall a big uh, bear uh, of a fellow with one of the greatest personalities that you would ever find I don't know anyone that ever had a bad or negative word to say about Dan. He was just a beautiful, fun, hilarious guy. 
he was uh, into music. But I don't know anyone, and I'm asking anyone here, do you, had you known anyone that would drive around with a tambourine in his car? And when we would go out, if you were out having dinner, and all of a sudden you'd hear this tambourine somewhere in the back of the restaurant, you, you knew that, that it was uh, Dan. Uh, he was very effective when he worked for the Association of Counties, and he took my office, the Speaker's office, to a new level when he was our Director of uh, Intergovernmental uh, Relations. For, for me, it's, it's, uh, it's really a sad... Mr. Cedillo had told me that Dan was really going through a rough patch, and I told myself I was going to call him, and Mr. Cedillo, uh, I did not react as quickly as I should have, so I feel uh, terrible uh, about that. But when, when we asked to get some particulars on his life, the thing that uh, really brought tears uh, to my eyes is during the, this uh, message from the family, it references that how much he enjoyed his time with me, working with me as the director of intergovernmental uh, relations. He was a good man and, and will be missed. I'm sure a lot of the, I hope some of the members that are here that came from Sacramento did have the opportunity to get to know him because they're, uh, there might have been men as good, but there was no none that were better. And that's uh, uh, Dan, Dan Wall. On this, I'd like for a, a few signatures. I think that if Mr. Fuentes, I think all of us that are from, that had worked in the Capitol should sign that. So I'm making this request that... Uh, that occurred because I believe most of us had a relationship with him one way or the other. And if you didn't have a relationship, that tambourine you heard, that was Dan's. Who carries a tambourine in their car? Anyway, Mr. Cedillo. Mr. Speaker, let me uh, suggest and speculate. The reason you didn't react was the same reason that I didn't. It's impossible to think that a man with so much life was not going to be with us. I could not uh, respond. You know, my um, uh, Jan, my scheduler, my office manager, Jan had sent me a message and called, and um, it was just impossible to comprehend. Uh, I had to look up some pictures and see him on Facebook. He had lost like 50 pounds. He's a big, burly guy with a big mustache and uh, <clears throat> loved that music and remember in the spring we'd have those parties a few blocks away from the Capitol and he'd show up with his big Hawaiian shirt and his <laughs> guitar and his tambourine and um, the man loved life it was difficult to think when he worked uh, that's how effective he was because you didn't know he was lobbying you uh, you didn't know quite what he was doing but he was doing his job he was being effective he did a great job for the county. Uh, we met during a lot of uh, tumultuous years, uh, efforts around the hospital, around the rebuild, uh, around a lot of policies that were difficult. And a lot of times we had uh, sharp differences with the uh, Board of Supervisors. But, uh, and it was Dan's job to come and uh, uh, help bring us together. And he did a great job because you couldn't be mad at Dan. It was impossible. Uh, and then at the end of the year, he was always there for all our uh, seasonal wrap-ups. He's just a great, wonderful uh, human being. As you said, there may be some equal, but there were none better. Uh, just a really great man. And, and like I said, it's, it's impossible to comprehend. Uh, I spoke to Dan, my chief, who I worked with for 22 years. Uh, he had the same reaction. Uh, you would think the first thing you'd want to do is go rush over there, but you can't embrace the reality. And as such, you, we try to ignore it as if it, uh, 
as if uh, that will have some impact on it. And all of us are at a great loss uh, at the loss of Dan Wall. Thank you. And we should give our condolences to his uh, wife and family. Yep. He was married for 42 years. Yep. 42 years. Okay, members, any other journey, Mr. Englander? Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, today I adjourn the memory of William Edward Kuehling, who's a professor at California State University, Northridge, for over 30 years. Prior to joining the staff at CSUN, he spent 10 years in the U.S. Air Force, he was a veteran of the Korean War. Earning his doctorate in sociology at the University of Southern California, he special, specialized in fields of social psychology and became nationally recognized as an authority on the elderly. He established, taught, or lectured at the university level, concentrating on the areas of African-American aging, psychology, sociology, and leadership. Dr. Hewling provided the initial training for members of the innovative and successful LA County Department of Children Protective Services Black Family Investment Project Pilot Program. In his capacity as an educator, mental health professional, and community activist, Dr. Hewling was a founding member of the Pan-African Studies Department at CSUN. He has chaired or served on numerous boards and task forces, including the Third World Counselors Association, San Fernando Valley Community Mental Health Center, San Fernando Valley Branch of the NAACP Executive Committee, the University of the California Regents Advisory Committee, and the San Fernando Valley Interfaith Council. Through the years, Dr. Hewling has accumulated numerous awards, tributes, honors, and resolutions, including those from Phi Kappa Phi National Honor Society, the City of Los Angeles, the United States Congress, Juvenile Justice Correction Project, Boys and Girls Club of America, the Valley Interfaith Council, and the NAACP. Our deepest sympathies go to him and his families, his co-workers, and uh, his son, uh, this survived uh, his son Kevin, who also remains very active. Thank you. Okay, I'm still on my left side, uh, Mr. Buscaino. Thank you, colleagues. I ask that we adjourn in memory of Cassandra Yvonne Payne, who was an advocate for children, youth, and families. She dedicated her life in helping people, able and disabled, find their ways toward a better life. She was a leader in the community and served on the County of Los Angeles Housing Commission as chair of the Tenants' Rights Council. Cassandra was very instrumental in helping to further the youth build movement here in Los Angeles and participated in uh, helping hundreds of at-risk youth and young adults achieve their high school diploma, learn leadership and development skills, construction, job training, education, and employment opportunities through the YES program, Youth Build program. She was also actively involved in volunteering and providing leadership to SNN Special Needs Network founded by attorney um, Ariva Martin. Cassandra was a great mother to her four daughters, um, Brianna, Brittany Ford, Brigie McDonald, Brooke, and Brandon Carter, her only son. May she rest in peace. Thank you. I'm still looking to my left side. Are there any more journey motions? I don't see any. To the right, Mr. Parks. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have a more formal notice on Friday, but we just want to make the community aware that Hattie O'Quinn, at the age of 106, passed away uh, this week. Her funeral services will be Saturday, uh, January the 31st, 11 a.m. at Phillips Temple CMB Church, 973 East 43rd Street, Los Angeles. I had the pleasure of uh, presenting a city council resolution to her at her 100th birthday, and the family just called us this week and said that she had passed away at 106. So we'll have a formal uh, document for Friday. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Any more? I do not see uh, any more adjourning motions. Uh, members, this council meeting is adjourned.